Welcome back to the Goldmark Gallery. Since our last exhibition of pots by the Korean potter Kang Hyo Lee in 2017, his reputation, which was already pretty significant, has risen to stratospheric heights. He's had huge solo exhibitions in Hong Kong and his native Seoul. He's been invited to group shows and festivals in places like Milan and Paris, to Shigaraki, to Taipei and Hong Kong. Well, now we can add little old Rutland in the middle of England too, because this is our latest exhibition of his work. We have some extraordinary pots in this exhibition, some forms that people won't have seen from Kankyo. We've got some beautiful, expressive brushwork, I think more than we've ever seen from one of his exhibitions. So I'm delighted to be walking through this exhibition today, and I hope you enjoy it. Korea has a ceramic history that goes back thousands of years, and we'll see the hallmarks of that tradition in Kang Kyo's work in this exhibition. We've got the extraordinary, ubiquitous moon jar form here. We'll see some more of those later. We'll also see plenty of the Bunchong decoration, which is his staple. Bunchong is a classic in Korean pottery. It's a fairly straightforward technique. Its name means more or less what it is white slip on a dark grey body with a clear or sometimes slightly bluish or greenish glaze. You can see from some of these pots that stark contrast immediately. It's a lovely dark, rich, iron-rich clay, quite sort of thick in texture, with this beautiful milky white slip that's been applied. Bunchong has a fairly particular history, a fairly particular place in Korean ceramics. It emerged uh, almost as a sort of imitation of the classic old celadons of Korean history, which were themselves an imitation of beloved jade. And then, as porcelain became more important in Korea, as the sort of pure white clay of porcelain became hugely popular, Bunchong was then trying to imitate porcelain works. It was often thought of as something maybe slightly more rustic or less refined sort of pottery of the everyday folk, but it was also used for ceremonial wares for government officials. Most importantly, when Korea was invaded by the Japanese at the end of the 16th century and Korean potters were taken back to the Japanese mainland, it was this sort of work, the simple slipped tea bowls, rice bowls, that really inspired Japanese ceramics, that turned it on its head. And Bunchong lived a second life in Japan. Tang Hyo Lee's work has really been a reinvigoration of Bunchong, which was a form of pottery that had really sort of fallen out of favour by the 20th century. But we'll see in this exhibition some newer work too. He said to me recently, in an interview that he's been spending more time with porcelain and we'll see more porcelain wares throughout this exhibition. He's also been more painterly, I think, more expressive. He's been uh, experimenting with something new. In particular, this combination of cobalt and a kind of black stain that he's used on the surface of these porcelain bottles, also with, you'll see, some painted on gold and silver. It's a very different feeling from some of the pots that we've had in the past. And it really goes to show that Bunchong for Kangyo is kind of linked to um, the history of sort of landscape painting in Korea, the sort of traditional uh, Korean folk painting, and that world that that kind of painting evokes. You'll see the, the sort of the vigor of some of these brush marks that seem to capture the feeling of, of streams, of trees and forests, of, of mountainous regions uh, that you see across Korea. Most important of all, I think this brushwork conveys some of the energy that Kang Hyo brings to his ceramics. Although he's thoroughly versed in the traditions of Korean ceramics, this feels like something that is much his own. He's brought his own personal energy to it. But it was another of Korea's ceramic traditions that really Kang Hyo going, and that was the giant ongi pots. 
These are essentially huge vessels used for storing fermented foods, things like kimchi, soybeans. And it was as a student in Seoul, visiting ceramic museums and seeing traditional ongi pots thrown, uh, coiled, built using paddles over the centuries that really got him inspired. So after his time at university, after his mandatory military service, Kang Hyo sought out the help of an ongi master right in the south of Korea, about as far away from Seoul as you could get. This was a really difficult period of Korea's history. It was towards the end of its last dictatorship. Student protests and demands for democracy were still being met with violent suppression. And actually the workers at the Yonggi workshop thought that this young student from university who'd come all the way from Seoul right to the very southern tip of Korea must be avoiding arrest. In fact, this period proved foundational to his work. He spent three years there, and it was learning the techniques of building up ongi pots from huge coils of thick clay, paddling them up into great walls, that has really seen him uh, develop this extraordinary range of work. There are some huge ongi sculptural vessels that he's created, but also some of the techniques that he's brought to smaller work, things like uh, some of these built, squared off bottles, some of the extraordinary mountain forms, which we'll see in just a moment. What drew him to Ongi, that beautiful fullness, that volume, the kind of amplitude he's brought to other work. So we've got these wonderfully buoyant moon jars that have a kind of feeling like, almost like lanterns lifting up into the air. Many of Kang Hyo's larger pieces have names or titles. They're called things like the sky, the forest, wind, wildflower, tree of life, or these magnificent mountain water forms. Kang Hyo told me that Korea is nearly 70% mountains, and that in this land of valleys, of streams, of big rivers carving through it, it's a country full of gentle, large curves. He finds that Bunchong perfectly fits this kind of soft, expressive land where there are no neat lines. The landscape of Korea, its natural world, has been as important to Kang Hyo as it was to Korea's traditional painters over the years. Equally important has been the sun and the moon. Sun and moon worship has been a foundational part of Korean identity for many thousands of years. And the moon jar sort of captures that delight in the moon. The sun and the moon give us a white light, this sort of pale colour, and also long associated with harvest rituals, which have been very important. The colour white has also formed a very important part of Korean culture, and for a long time they were actually known uh, around the world as the white-clad folk. In Korean society of old, coloured clothing showed your hierarchy within the social status, and it was the colour white that was left for everyday folk, plain, undyed cloth. In fact, the colour white went even further back, back to times of shamanistic ritual, of dances performed in white robes. It went back to the times of Buddhist thought, to ideas, notions of the void, of emptiness, and also to Confucianism, which took over Korea. The idea of white as a kind of pure colour, a colour of innocence, a colour that showed an absence of material desire. All of that came together in the form of the moon jar, which became extremely popular from the 16th century onwards. And all of that history is contained in Kang Hyo's work. This colour white, which combined with the dark clay, gives you this beautiful spectrum of greys, this complex, misty surface that's not just reflective of the country itself, of the streams, the colours of the landscape, the mist and fog through the mountain ranges but also of that complex system of belief, that murky combination of religion, of spirituality, that's still a hugely important part of Korea. It's when Kang Hyo is applying that colour white to his pots that we see the real expressive variety of slipwear, of bunchong in particular. It can be applied thick so that the colour is almost matte. You have this beautiful, milky 
opacity. It can be thinned down so that you get much more of the grey clay coming from underneath. And on works like this beautiful, large, rounded form here, Kankyo can draw his hands through this thin slip. He can use a brush made from straw or twigs, dragged through with the most delicate of touches to give some kind of elemental feeling, capturing something like the invisible wind across a Korean valley. But then it can also be used more expressively. So if I turn this form around to show you the other face, we have this extraordinary explosion of white colour, this beautiful expressiveness. The iron from the clay given these beautiful ranges of colour and the reflection of light off the surface of this pot dappling a shelf below it. It's in pots like this where if you see Kankyo decorating, moving his hands across the surface of the pot, feeling the form of the clay underneath, the softness of the slip surface, it's here that Kankyo describes the clay almost as a kind of conduit. It's here where he, Kankyo, the man, the potter, his energy meets with the material quality of the clay, of the slip itself. And somehow the two are combined. Each pot is not just expressive of him, his thoughts, his feelings, his emotions, but also of the innate qualities of the place around him and of the material that he's working with. For Koreans, this thousand-year-long tradition, thousand-year-long cultural history has been hugely important in times of difficulty, adversity, times of resistance. It was to white hanbok clothing, to traditional Korean pottery, that Koreans looked back and found sustenance at the time of Japanese colonial invasion. In the 1980s, as Koreans, Korean students looked for democracy, it was again to traditional Korean clothing that they turned. Some years ago, in a period of difficulty in his own life, Kangyo turned back to that culture. He retreated to the mountains of Gayasan National Park, and spent two months there thinking about what it was that was important to him and found himself restored. I think there's a sense of something else emanating from Kangyo's work. There's not just his own personal reflection, his personal energy that he's brought to this work. Somehow that has tapped into the kind of collective spiritual energy of generations before him. It's not just tradition for tradition's sake in this pottery. This is modernised forms. These are sculptural works of quality. But I think more than that, in drawing out his own sense of expressiveness, of finding a way to deliver his own thoughts and feelings through this very uh, supple, expressive medium of Bunchong. He's also managed to draw out the energy that has inspired Korean potters for thousands of years. This is a very special show and we're extraordinarily lucky to have a potter as renowned, as regarded across the world as Kankyo here in our little gallery in Uppingham in the middle of England. I implore you, please, come have a look, see for yourself, feel some of these works. The surfaces have to be seen in the flesh to be really enjoyed, believed. It's a beautiful exhibition and it's not going to be here for long, so we look forward to seeing some of you here soon. Mm -hmm.